I am so delighted to be participating in South by Southwest EDU online this year and speaking to such an incredible community of teachers, of administrators, of university professors, business leaders, policymakers, students, all of you. You know, as a lifelong learner, I applaud all of you for the work that you're doing to impact education today and in the future. And I believe and know for sure that teachers have always been my heroes. And I think a lot of people are actually appreciating teachers differently now than ever before. Uh, with children homeschooling and e-learning, parents have truly come to see and experience what you do. So I think that's a good thing. This has been an extraordinary year from the moment our lockdowns began last March. What's really been on my mind is how do we process all of this? And more importantly, how do we help children process it? And so I am delighted today to be here with someone who I know can help answer those questions, Dr. Bruce Perry. So I'm here in my garden. You're joining me from Nashville, Tennessee, my old stumping ground. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm so good. You know, the truth is that you and I have been thinking about, talking about for a long time, working together for 25 years on issues surrounding what makes people behave the way they do, specifically childhood trauma. And uh, I'm so excited right now because, have you seen the book that we did together? I have. Well, it's a beautiful thing to see. Um, through deeply personal conversations, Oprah Winfrey and Dr. Bruce Perry explore how what happens to us in early childhood influences the people we become. They challenge us to shift from focusing on what's wrong with you or why is that guy behaving that way to asking what happened to you? This is such a critical question. And the reason why I wanted you to do a book about it that I get to sit and ask questions about is because several years ago, I think it was 2017 or 18, uh, I was doing a story for 60 Minutes on childhood trauma based on this place in uh, Milwaukee called St. A's Clinic. And I interviewed you for that. And although I've been talking to you for over 30 years about the effect of trauma on children's brain, it was in that moment that I had the biggest aha ever. Uh, it, it actually changed the way I see people. It changed the way I see myself. It changed the way I operate in business and it changed the way I operate my school because the question of not oh, what's wrong with you, but what happened to you allows us to look at a person from not a place of judgment, but a place of trying to understand what went on before that is causing that behavior. So that's a long intro into why does that shift matter? Well, it's one of the most important things about that shift in frame of reference is that we know that the experiences you have when you're growing up, both good and bad, shape the biology of your brain. And, and that sets you up for the way you see the world, the way, the way you uh, process experience, the way you interact with other people, the way you manage the physiology of your heart, your gut, your lungs. And so these early experiences literally have a major impact on your physical health, your mental health, your social health. And, and really every aspect of our society is impacted by developmental experiences and, and particularly developmental experiences that are toxic, traumatic. Okay, because a lot of people say, you know, what happened to you, you carry that into childhood. It's what happened to you as a child shaped the way you actually viewed the world and your world view determined your personal view of yourself. And that is why you either grow up with a sense of worthiness or not based on what your surroundings are. That's what I hear you saying. Exactly, exactly. You know, and one of the things that I think, I, I, just about anybody can sit back and think about influences on their life, whether it's uh, a coach or a teacher or your parents. 
and and I think people in, intuitively understand that your life experiences influence who you are. Right. But what I don't think they connect with is that those experiences literally change the biology of your body. Yes. Particularly the biology of your brain. That's what we did not realize until you came along to tell us. We know that those experiences influence the way we see the world. We did not know that it changes or has the impact on your brain. So let's start with the word trauma, because I know it's a term that's thrown a lot, thrown around a lot nowadays, and you'd like to be very specific. So how do you define trauma? Because the book that we have uh, co-authored, you did most of the authoring and I was the co-part, uh, is Conversations on Trauma, resilience and healing and we're going to talk specifically about those three things today because I know you have a different take on resilience than most people do that's so fascinating so let's start with trauma so everybody uses that term right yeah, they, yeah. they'll talk about how oh my god I was tra traumatized, traumatized by something that somebody said to me at lunch you know yeah and uh, when we are talking about trauma in this book, and when I talk about trauma in, a, in my work, I'm actually referring to uh, an experience that can literally influence the way your stress response systems work, and as a result, have long-term impact on the person. So, and this is an important thing because the experience itself is not necessarily the trauma. Two people can go into the same event and one will be completely overwhelmed and have long-term problems with sleep, anxiety, mm -hmm. impulsivity. Give me an example. And another person... Give me an example. A car accident, well, a fire, because most people think of exactly. traumas as major disasters in your life, a crisis. So you're saying two right. people can go into right. the same event and come out completely differently because... Exactly. Well, in, in part because both of them are going to have a slightly different ability to manage that event yeah. that they bring into it. So there may be somebody who has a history of inconsistent, uh, unpredictable life experiences, and they're more fragile. So when they're in a school fire, for example, they're going to have a much harder time than a child who has come from a stable, consistent, predictable background. And, and they'll both have some initial response but the child who has that stable background is going to have a, a higher probability of getting back to a healthy baseline. The other child's more vulnerable. So interesting. Also interesting that most people associate the word trauma with big dramatic events, like we're talking about fires exactly. or hurricanes or you know major disasters. But there are also uh, silent traumas or quiet traumas, I, the silent traumas I think you call them, that have also lasting impact, right. equally lasting impact. So, exactly, and I think that th this is an area that I hope the book will help people understand better. You know, one of the things that we're, we've been talking about in this, this last year as in our society is racism, right? And, and in the inequities of, uh, of poverty and, and the ab inappropriate maldistribution of wealth in our society. And, one of the things that we know is that the stress response systems in our body that are sort of housed in the brain predominantly, these systems are very, very malleable. They change in response to the pattern of stressor that you experience. And if your stress, your experiences with stress are unpredictable and inconsistent and you have no control over them, you can have changes in the biology of that stress response system that look just like a big capital T trauma, even though you never had any big event. And examples of that are being, let's say you are a minority child in a majority community. You're continually getting these little, little doses of like, why are you here? And, Microaggressions, and we here. call them. Microaggressions. You know, people can, Right, people have labeled them microaggressions, but when those happen, your stress response activates. And because it's unpredictable, these little activations all day long slowly transform your stress response system to becoming what we refer to as sensitized. It's 
overly active, it's tuned up, and then it's overly reactive. And so what will happen is somebody who has a stress response system like that is going to have a predisposition for having hypertension, for having diabetes, for having asthma. And it, mm -hmm. of course, if you look at children of color and youth of color in our society, their rates of asthma, heart disease, diabetes are higher than the general population. And it and all I goes back to that, that it all goes back to that question of what happened to you, how what your early childhood exactly. development was like. So here's the thing that really exactly. is if I can get this message to the world, I will be so satisfied. People may be surprised or even shocked to learn that our brain development and decision making patterns are shaped by the first few years of our life experiences. And, you know, when I first started talking to you 30 years ago, we were always, we were talking about, we were doing a program called Zero to Six, what happens in those zero to six years. Right. What I have since learned from our discussions is that it's not even, it, it is zero to six, but those first two months, the fact that, yeah. explain how, what happened, which, which makes sense because anybody who ever has ever had a baby, been around a baby, knows anything about babies knows, in those first couple of months, that baby, baby is just taking in everything. They're like a sponge. And you're saying exactly. in this in this book that if in the first two months, go ahead, explain it. All right, so. This is it, this is the bing, bing, bing moment. Attention, everyone. All right, so first of all, I think, you know, there's a lot of work that's shown that adverse experiences or traumatic experiences during development change your, your biology and make you at increased risk for heart disease, you know, mental health problems, substance abuse, all kinds of bad things. But if you actually start to look at when those adverse experiences take place, it turns out that the most important time appears to be this first, you know, the first start in life, the first couple of months. And so when we look at kids who have lots of adversity and few relational supports, in the first two months of life, and then they get into a healthy environment. After only two bad months, they have worse outcomes than kids that have a good two months. They have consistent, predictable, nurturing care in the first two months of life, and then something happens where all kinds of bad things happen, lots of trauma, lots of adversity. Those kids do better than the, you know, than the kids who had, you know, all kinds of wonderful things for years and years and years. And that is the, why the, 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 often when people adopt a child and the child is six months old, say, and that child went through a lot of trauma in the first couple of months, and it's zero to, to, to two months, and then that child is put in an environment where everything is wonderful and they're being nurtured and supported and you can't yeah. figure out what, because I know somebody who actually had this with, with their child who's now 20 something years old and they're still having problems and you can't figure right. out why all the things that I'm doing aren't really working. It's because what happened, what happened to that child, what happened to you in the first exactly. couple of months, because in those first com exactly. couple of months are really crucial. So does that mean that if you're zero to two months, horrible things are happening, chaos, people are cursing around you, all kinds of you know, manifestations of, 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 of darkness are, are showing up around you and you don't have the language to explain it, uh, which is another point I wanna to get to, that when terrible things happen to you as a child and you don't have the language to explain it, it's more damaging than if it happens to you older and you at least can process it through language. Well, you, you have more tools. You know, the older you get, the more tools you have to understand and make sense out of what's happening to you. But a, a, an infant doesn't have the, the, their brain is not developed yet to the point where they can really understand what is happening. And furthermore, these key regulatory systems, these key stress response systems that we write about, they're organizing very rapidly early in life. Like you said, it's a sponge-like sort of responsivity to what they're experiencing. And so if those stress response systems experience chaos, threat, uh, and all kinds of extreme things, 
they'll literally be these genetic changes in the way those systems organize and they'll literally view the world as a threatening place. And, and that initial signal from the world that you're going to live in a threatening place, so you need to be prepared for danger, so you need to activate your stress response and walk around in a state of fear all the time. And so what that means is, if even in a safe environment, if your brain is primed to respond to, to everything as if it's a threat, a teacher who comes up to you and tries to be kind, your brain will go, what do you want from me? As opposed to, let me listen to you. And that leads to this cascade of problems that just magnifies as you get older. And the key thing, and we write about this in the book, the key thing is that the older the child gets, and the more they struggle with these things, the more the adult world misunderstands their behavior. So instead of saying your inattention and your aggressive behavior is because of what happened to you, it's because you have some other problem and so we're going to punish you and exclude you. And, and it literally leads to this, this sort of vicious negative cycle of misunderstanding and then uh, actions on the part of the adult world that further traumatize the child. So you, you explain to us this. You want us to imagine the brain as a four-layer cake because you say the key question uh, is not only is what happened to you. The key question is if you want to understand someone, it's, it's the key question to if you want to understand also the brain. So to explain this, you want us to imagine the brain as a four-layer cake. Right, and I, and again, I, I think one of the reasons I wanted to write this book was that I believe that the more science literate our population becomes, not just about what we're talking about, but a, but a, a lot of other things, but I think that the more our, our, our everybody understands a little bit about how the brain works and how the brain changes, the better off we're going to be. We'll be better parents, we'll be better teachers, we'll be better in law enforcement, and and one of the simple fundamental tools we do to, to help teach people these things is have them envision the brain as this upside down triangle. And down at the bottom are these sort of regulatory systems that control heart rate, blood pressure, and so forth. And as you get higher and higher in the brain, you get to the cortex, the top part of your brain that's the most uniquely human part of our brain. So if you look at all of the capabilities that we have as a species, the most uniquely human capabilities arise from systems in our cortex. And so That's at the top of the brain. Language. That's at the top of the brain. At the, at the top of the brain. And that, those capabilities are the things that we're trying to basically encourage and build into the brain of a, of a child when we teach them right from wrong, when we teach them language, when we teach them geography, when we teach them the story of our people. All of those things go into the cortex. But the dilemma is, down here in the lower part of the brain, we've got these regulatory networks involved in the stress response. And when they're activated, and when you feel under threat, the first thing that happens is you shut down the top part of your brain. And so if you want to teach a child who has trauma-related dysregulation, you're going to have to figure out how to regulate them before you talk to them about geography. You're going to have to figure out how to regulate them before you talk to them about math. All of the things we're trying to do in education, parenting, therapy, that are intended to reach the top part of the brain, they're never going to get there if we don't first deal with the trauma-altered stress response systems that originate in the lower part of the brain. Okay, so it's why you also say you can never in an argument, if, so, if you're in an argument with someone, and this goes for whether you're arguing with a child, or a child is really angry and upset, if someone is angry, you can never reach them through more anger. And that's just not philosophical or social. That's actually the way your brain works. Biology. It's yeah. biology. Our brains, are, our brains are exquisitely attuned to the relational cues that other people are giving. We're contagious to the emotions of other people. So if you're in an and argument... So if somebody is... If you're in an argument with your spouse, interrupting here. If you're in an uh, if you're in an argument with your spouse, for example, and you're uh, you're they're, they're escalating and you're escalating, and you're trying to reason with them, there's no reason that can actually be uh, 
received because the brain won't let it. So you're saying exactly. you can't coach, you can't reason, you can't teach, you can't get somebody to agree with you when they're in the midst of their anger, period. Exactly. It does exactly. not work. Exactly. And, and the reason that is, and this is something that is just simple biology, and everybody can learn this. And once people do learn this, it really opens up a lot of doors for the way you understand the people around you yeah. and yourself. And so the key to this is that when I talk with you, Oprah, and when the people who are listening to us, when they hear us, that information goes into the lower part of their brain first. Yeah. It doesn't go directly to their cortex. It has to get through this lower kind of reactive part of our brain, and then it has to go through the emotional part of our brain, and then it finally gets up to the reasoning part of our brain. So there's a lot of places where you can get short-circuited. And, and so that's why we use this term. We talk about you know, the sequence of engagement. If you really want to get to somebody's cortex, first of all, they have to be regulated. And, and then you have to connect with them as a person, you know, that use those relational sort of super highways. You keep using the term regulated. The you keep using the term regulated, and I don't think a yeah. lot of people are familiar with that term. I know in your world, sure. you all regulate all the time. And now <laughs> I teach this at my school, so I knew that it was getting through when I went back to school uh, in 2019, which is the last time I've seen all the girls. And they're all talking to me about their regulation practices. So, <laughs> and they're saying, so one girl actually said to me, Mama, what do I do when someone is clicking their pen to regulate themselves, but it's dysregulating me? So <laughs> I, I I, they're, they're all into being regulated. So explain what that means. What does being regulated mean? Well, broadly speaking, it means being in balance. It means being, being in so, balance. Yeah. Being in balance. And we have... You know, your body has all these systems that, you know, your lungs help you sort of manage and keep in balance your oxygen levels. And so if your oxygen level gets low because you're working really hard by walking up steps, you'll take deeper breaths. And so that's, you get a little dysregulated by getting short of breath and, and your body will work to regulate you, get you back in balance. And so we have these, all of the systems that we have, uh, the systems that have to do with sleep and wake, the systems we have to do with, um, you know, oxygen and sugar in our blood, for example, they're always trying to keep us in balance. And, and so these stress response systems that I kind of talked about that are in the lower part of the brain, they're continually getting information from the outside world and from the inside world. And one of the major sets of signals that your brain cues into is the relational milieu. Which, which I basically mean the, the signals coming from the people around you. And so if you're getting signals from the people in your classroom, for example, that you belong, you feel safe. You feel regulated. But going back to these microaggressions that I talked about earlier, if you're getting signals that you don't quite belong, you're not one of us, you literally feel dysregulated. And it, it's a stressor. And so anything that makes you feel um, marginalized, minimized, degraded, not heard, it activates your stress response. Well, since, since uh, you have, listen, you just have to read the book for that because we only got this much time, <laughs> okay? What happened to you? Uh, so valuable to anybody who wants to know more about their own behavior and the behavior of people around them, and particularly to educators. And since we are speaking to educators today, one of the concerns I know for parents and educators, you were just mentioning that so many children are experiencing major setbacks out not only in terms of uh, their education, but also in their social emotional development and sense of isolation uh, during the pandemic. The, the CDC reported that from March to October 2020, I think the proportion of ER visits related to mental health increased 24% for children age 5 to 11 and 31% among adult adolescents aged uh, 12 to 17. So is it possible to heal from the damage that's been done this past year? It's gonna take time. It, it, it is possible. Healing is always possible. 
The question is whether or not the educational community and uh, the, the people who support that community are going to be willing to do the things that we know will help these kids become better regulated and recover and sort of restore their resilience. But right now what we know is that, that this last year has tapped out. It's, it's sort of drained the reserves of all the educators. It's drained the reserves of children. It's drained the reserves of... Healthcare uh, workers? Healthcare workers. A and I think one of the things that's, that's really important is that, you know, there were people who started a, this pandemic who were already on empty. And so those families and those children, they're really going to have a hard time coming back. How do we make up for lost time? Or should we think of it as making up for lost time or just starting where we are now? I think trying to catch up is going to cause people a lot more stress instead of like, this is where we are now, and now here's what we need to do. You are spot on. I mean, that the most important thing, I think, is for people to remember what we were talking about earlier, the sequence of engagement, right? So if you are dysregulated, that top part of your brain, the cortex, it's shut down. And so no matter how much you teach, if you go to summer school, if you do twice as much educational instruction, you're not going to get any more change in the cortex. So the first thing that we need to do with these kids and with the teachers is help them get regulated. Get regulated, get back into routines, get back into connecting with each other, and, and, and then basically adhere to regulate, relate, and then reason. If we do this the right way, if we create an environment, if school is about play, you know, if we're coming back into school focuses on play, physical hygiene, like how's your sleep, how's your nutrition, are you getting enough exercise, let's get our base put in place, then once the cortex is open, learning can go very, very, very fast. But if you try to teach kids or push teachers when they're dysregulated, you're going to make it worse. We'll fall, we'll fall further behind. And what are ways to regulate ourselves as adults and ways to regulate children if you're working with children? You know, one of the, there, there are kind of two go-to things that help people get regulated. One is being with other people. You know, when you're in the presence of people who you belong with, who you feel connected to, you feel safer, you feel regulated. These kids need to play with each other. You know, teachers like having their, well, are going to be happy about having their class full when everybody can be safe and healthy. And so that's one thing, reconnect and, and encourage relational interactions. The second thing is to take advantage of, of rhythm. You know, rhythm is sort of the, this fundamental regulatory gift that our brain has that comes from our earliest experiences in utero where our brain made associations between maternal heart rate and not being hungry, not being cold, not being thirsty. And so we were talking about these memories we have in the lower parts of our brain. One of the first primal sets of memories we have have to do with the power of pattern, repetitive, rhythmic activity and being regulated. And so things like let's let kids run, let, you know, dance, music, uh, oh, 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 there's a whole range of activities. Hard to do, Bruce, when every, all the kids are still wearing their masks and everybody's supposed to be social distancing. That's part of the challenge. Yeah. Yes. It but, is part of the challenge. But, it is. But I want all of the educators who are listening to us right now to hear, hear what you're saying. It is regulate first before you can have any kind of reasoning happening, period. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You know, several years ago, I interviewed uh, Shaka Senkor, who, uh, for Super Soul, as a teenager, he got involved with gangs and drugs and ended up spending 19 years in prison, is now out and doing remarkable things. Uh, but at one point, he was a straight A student, around nine years old, and wanted to be a doctor, and came home one day and his mother threw a pot of something at him and broke the tiles in the kitchen when he came in to tell her that he had gotten an A. And he said his mom was always having these kinds of episodes. And after that moment, his grades started to fail, he started hanging out with the wrong crowd and all of that. But during that entire time, from this kid going from straight A's, wanting to be a doctor, 
life then starts to fall apart. Nobody ever asked what happened to him. What are what, what's going on in his family that would cause him to sort of, you know, spiral that way? So I wonder what are some of the signs of trauma educators should be looking for in a child to tip them off that something isn't right? How do, how do educators begin asking that question? And if we can get people, especially, to not ask, the, when your brain goes to, what's wrong with that kid? and you want to take them to the principal's office, your brain should be saying, what happened to this kid? Let's figure out what's going on. Exactly. You know, one of the things that is a, a very, very common manifestation of trauma that's seen in, this, in the classrooms is inattention. And a lot of times these kids that are inattentive are actually either hypervigilant, you know, they're kind of scanning every little noise, because of their trauma-related changes, or they're tuning out because they're dissociating. And, and both of those adaptive responses get labeled as attention deficit disorder. Yeah. And so they're mislabeled and mischaracterized. These kids frequently end up on medications which don't help very much. And so that's one of the major ways that you see it. One of the other things that people see a lot in educational settings uh, is this, um, what I would call the kind of a passivity and compliance on the part of students that teachers misinterpret as them being quiet little learners or they follow good directions, they're really good little girls, good little boys. But if, if you look carefully, what you find is that these kids are doing all of these compliant behaviors just because they, they want to get the teacher to leave them alone yeah. and, and back off. And so that, that pleasing, that trying to be excessively um, compliant and trying to please the teacher, not always. I mean, it's great if a teacher has a kid who wants to please you, but if, if it feels excessive, that can sometimes be a manifestation of trauma. Um, um, okay. You mentioned disassociation, and I think... Uh, this is one of the great learning uh, experiences I had to go through at my school in South Africa because we're only taking in girls who've been traumatized. And what we learned is that disassociation was a part of their coping mechanism. And a lot of teachers, before we were attuned to your way of teaching, um, thought that What's wrong with this kid? You know, I'm st you're standing in front of the child and you're lecturing, 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 and the child is daydreaming. People who have been through traumatic situations tend to disassociate in order to protect themselves. Because if you're raised in an environment where people are screaming and yelling and there's noise all the time, you've got to disassociate just to keep yourself right. centered and and regu regulated. And in when, balance, yeah, right. and in balance. And when things show up that are uncomfortable, like a science explanation or a math quiz that is uncomfortable to you, what the brain automatically goes to is disassociation. And then the, the teachers are like, what's wrong with you? But that's your normal way of coping. So it's important to understand yeah. that disassociation usually is the first thing that shows up with people who've been traumatized. That's exactly right. And, you know, the interesting thing about it is that it's sort of this confusing presentation for educators because one of the things that happens is a lot of kids that dissociate come to love reading and so they'll read really well and they'll do well on their reading assignments because reading is kind of a dissociative experience you can go to a different world and and it it's 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 a very positive form of dissociation but what happens is these very same kids who do well with reading when they try to do math, it just, they don't, they, they can't do it. And part of it's because math is this, requires this linear sequential focus. And these kids are like dipping in and out of attention. And, and so the teachers see a kid who gets all A's in reading and they get D's in their math. And they're thinking that, oh, that's because you're not trying. It's, I know you're smart. 
I, I know you can do it. You're just choosing not to do it because you're lazy or mm -hmm. you're passive aggressive or what? They, they come up with some negative interpretation. And very few of them understand that that's really dissociation. How does understanding what happened to a child um, bring clarity to why a child purposely acts out? A lot of times when a, when a teacher has a child who acts out in the class, they feel as if it's personalized, as if the misbehavior is directed towards them. And in fact, it, it, it very rarely is. If a child has a history of trauma, it's because just the behavior is kind of a manifestation at times of the fight or flight response. You know, whether it's physical proximity becomes an evocative cue. Every time any other adult got close to me and came up behind me, they were going to hurt me. So when the teacher comes over my shoulder to try to help me and they blow up and say, get away from me, that's basically a completely predictable defensive behavior by the child, but a completely confusing aggressive behavior to the teacher. And so the teacher misinterprets it. And, and, and again, one of the things that we've been able to do with educators is if we teach them about trauma and about these responses, they begin to shift the way they understand the child. They no longer take it personally. They, they ask what happened to you. Sometimes they, they may not know what happened, but they realize something did happen. Something happened. Yeah, and so they can then change the way they treat them. They don't kick them out of class. They don't punish them and make it worse. Right. They actually try to make some kind of accommodation. And over the years... And when that happens... Yeah, over the years, yeah. children have been punished, they've been ostracized, oh. they've been um, condescended to, they've been made to feel shamed by the behavior, which only makes it worse. Tell me this. If, you know traumatic things that happen to you from zero to two months are embedded there in the brain, if those first six years have a major impact on how you see the world and view the world and in the formation of your personality, how then can you even begin to change things that happened to you at a time when you had no control over it? Well, that's, that's a very important Big, big question. Big, big. And big, big. That we begin answer to answer in, in what happened to you. Okay. Exactly. You do not have enough time and here, Mr. Scientist, to explain it, but go ahead. I, give I, it a shot. I won't explain it to you. I'll <laughs> give it a shot. So basically what we know is that all parts of the brain are malleable, changeable. The key is actually reaching the parts of the brain with sufficient repetition to cause change. And so children who have these early life insults that result in it, these profound abnormalities during development, if you end up getting uh, opportunities for consistent, predictable, stable relationships over time, you will over time get better. Even if you had a bad start, it, it, you can get better. Yes. It just takes time. And, and it all, takes people. It all takes it takes is one person who believes in you. It's why. Every time I see the picture of Mrs. Duncan or a tape of Mrs. Duncan from when we had her on the show, I break into tears because I was saved by Mrs. Duncan, my fourth grade teacher, and other teachers around me. That's why I love teachers so much because all it takes is one person who believes in you. And for a lot of children in this world, that's all they have are the people who are in their churches or communities or you know schools. It's schools for most kids. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Bruce Perry, for writing this My book, pleasure. What Happened to You, for enlightening me, and uh, hopefully now we'll be able to bring that enlightenment to a lot of other people to understand themselves, and particularly understanding how what happened to you shaped the way you see the world and what you can do now if you want to change that view of the world. What Happened to You is available April 27th wherever books are sold. Thank you everybody at South by Southwest EDU for joining us.